We are a death-denying culture. Old, old age is costly. A sick old, old age is costlier. We spend probably almost half of what we spend in our lifetime in the last tenth of our lives. That's, that's huge. And we've got to figure out how to make that reasonably efficient and how to make it affordable. Caregivers Confronting the Care System is underwritten by Altarum Institute. Altarum, solving complex systems problems to improve human health. The availability of caregivers and the affordability of elder care are among the issues we face as our country ages dramatically in the coming years. Hello, I'm Desiree Cooper, your host for Caregivers Confronting the Care System. Most Americans now have an unprecedented opportunity to live into old age. The change is a major success of public health policies and the healthcare industry. However, the graying of our society is presenting challenges we aren't prepared for, particularly for women in their 50s. Here are some facts to consider. Women will now spend more years caring for an ailing family member than they do raising their own children. Women average seven years as widows. Chances are they'll live in a nursing home and stay there longer than a man would. Women may also face financial hardships as illness and disability deplete family savings accounts. Additionally, safety nets including Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid only go so far when paying for costs related to caregiving. Adding to the problem is our aging boomer generation. The number of adults needing care will likely double in the next 10 to 15 years as boomers pass from 75 to 80 years old. Our program will examine the issues of the so-called silver tsunami. Let's join our moderator, Eleanor Cliff, and our powerhouse panel of caregiving experts as they share some of their own experiences with elder care. Let me begin. I'd like for you to share your stories, and uh, why don't we begin with um, Cheryl here on my uh, left. I first realized that my mother just wasn't the person who raised me. She was still managing her money, but she just was not my mother. And over the next 10 years, I cared for her, raised two children who were under the age of 10, and was a faculty member at a medical school. Mm -hmm. So it was very difficult to take care of her, especially since she was in Philadelphia, I was in Chicago, and my brother was in Haiti for most of the time. But luckily, we had a very strong and very close family in Philadelphia that could help, except that most of them were older than she was. And there came a time when I had to move her. And I was very blessed that I knew what was wrong. I knew how to find out what I needed to get. I needed to get those things quickly, and I was able to do that. Most people don't have that information. Is the common experience here ha handling uh, the care of an older uh, parent? Yeah. Um, you're nodding yes. yes. <laughs> well, for me, um, I practically have caregiving in my DNA. I grew up in a caregiver household. My parents took care of all four of my grandparents over a 21-year period. So essentially, I grew up in a long-term care setting, and I do believe <laughs> that sensitivity has helped over the years as I pursued a career. Um, now I'm helping provide care for my parents. So it's sort of like the circle of life, everything coming around full circle. My being here stems from what I see as a geriatrician, as a physician caring for the oldest, the frailest, the most vulnerable, the sickest of patients. And what they're faced with, in addition to trying to figure out how to get through the day and how to where to live and how to lead a, a meaningful life, uh, the, the big questions. They're also struggling with their medical care, with their everyday needs for how to manage increasingly complex medical conditions. And then if they go to the hospital, uh, they're faced with a really bewildering array of possible interventions, dialysis and cardiopulmonary resuscitation and intensive care units. The list goes on and on. And it's, it's a tenet of modern medical care that patients should be involved in that decision making and that's a good thing. But for these very frail, very old, very sick people, involvement in their daily medical care and involvement in medical decision making 
just has to involve the caregiver. Joanne, you have personal experience, clinical experience, uh, all around uh, perspective on these issues. What are the lessons that we should take away from our personal stories? When we took in my husband's parents, um, my father-in-law had uh, Parkinson's and my mother-in-law was healthy then and over the next 18 years gradually died with dementia. Um, you, know, you just sort of do it because you know, your family expects it of you and so on and you have no idea what you're getting into. And I actually had a very sick son at the time and it was fascinating how no one could do enough to help me with my son. You know, the church, the neighborhood, the people at work, you know, anything could be done. I was expected to buck up and handle the in-laws. And, you know, if the aid didn't show or, you know, something got worse, it was an annoyance to people that I'd have to be pulled out to do uh, caregiving. You seem to inject a note of urgency into this. I wonder if one of you others could uh, address that topic as well, the, the urgent need and how, how maybe you see it in your practice or in, in your life. It's already happening. And mm -hmm. I have a practice that has a lot of people with dementia. And we are diagnosing dementia earlier. So it's not just about age. It's about people who have no resources and no function. Everybody's saying it's coming. It's already here. But I think part of the urgency is related to the recognition that not only do we have caregiving needs, but that the medical problems that um, older people have are costing this society a great deal of money. Uh, but that is part of the urgency, but I think it may also be part of the hope and the solution mm -hmm. that uh, policymakers recognize that we've got a problem because of the costs. And I think one of our jobs is to stay, say that perhaps we can deal with some of those costs if we stop subjecting people to extremely expensive and not terribly beneficial procedures mm -hmm. and instead pay more attention to the kinds of needs that really matter to many of them, which have more to do with caregiving. Mm -hmm. It's a privilege, first of all, for people to let you into their lives the way they mm -hmm. do. And to be able to tell people, yes, it's okay to talk about this. Mm -hmm. I understand that you're unhappy, that you resent this. I mean, we need to be the ones to open that door. We used to bury lots of 40 and 50 year olds. You know, the chance to live to old age is one of the great gifts of modern society. You know, most people will make it to really complete a life, to right. have had a chance to work and to contribute and to sort things out for themselves. But a piece of the price of that is you'll have to live a piece of time with the frailties of old age. We know the percentage of aging people needing care in our country will double in the coming years. Our panel examines how community-based services and technological changes could lead to more affordable caregiving in the future. We are looking at the entire way that we provide care now. And it's sort of been forced upon us due to finances and the boomers uh, changing the demographics in our culture. But we're going to be moving more and more to community-based services. And there, I think we can balance compassion with effectiveness and cost. Um, as long as we maintain that balance, it's so key. We have it already in the simplest form of assistive devices, of wheelchairs and canes and things of that nature. There are lots of lifts. Um, and then now we have more sophisticated technology coming uh, into being that has the potential for taking some of the physical stress and strain right. away from caregivers so they can concentrate on the things that truly do make it a meaningful right. uh, a job. Joanne, you used to work for CMS, which oversees the Medicare system. So I think dollars and cents are probably uh, close to your thinking. Uh, what do you think about the affordability of the, the kind of future we want? However we do it, we are going to face a period of time that's going to be very expensive. I mean, you just have so many numbers. Mm -hmm. But if we could get the per person costs down, then we, I think we could get through this all right. And some of these ideas are the kinds of things the devices Muriel's talking about will really help. But I think also things like um, the fact that we'll have these huge arrays of records so that instead of the usual dodge that the doctor gives when you know, the family says, well, what's likely to happen to mother? And the doctor says, well, we'll have to just wait and see. I think it'll only be a few years before families will learn to say, I actually want to know what happened to 10 people just like my mother who you took care of more than a year ago. 
Okay, let's see how many survived. How many are in nursing homes? What kind of care did they need? If you could wave a magic wand and pass legislation through a Congress that doesn't seem to want to pass much legislation, but if you could, what would it address? What would it be called? In terms of a magic wand, I would say quality, choice, dignity, support, and resources. There are three groups that have a lot at stake in this. Mm -hmm. Medicare that we've alluded to, Medicaid, which pays for most of nursing care as well as a lot of home services in this country, and private employers whose employees are losing time because they're running off taking care of mom and deal, putting out fires and dealing with emergency room. So I think we need to make sure that each of those big three hmm. have incentives to make changes. The Medicare incentive that you were already alluding to, Lynn, is primarily but not exclusively related to hospitalization. And we have a big problem with frequent hospitalizations among older people, recurrent hospitalizations where people are readmitted. 20% of older people who are discharged from a hospital are readmitted in 30 days, and Medicare is very worried about this. Uh, and if we could do something in terms of supporting caregivers, that would provide better care at home and prevent at least a fraction of those readmissions, that would be in the interest of Medicare. From Medicaid's point of view, it costs a minimum of $65,000 a year to have someone in a nursing home. If you use a fraction of those dollars to provide caregiver support so people can stay at home, that would have an enormous impact and make Medicaid happy. I mean, it's a win-win situation. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? Mm -hmm. And then in terms of the, the, the private sector, um, recognizing that their 50-year-old employees are the ones who are also spending 20, 25 hours a week on average taking care of an elderly relative and providing them with educational tools to do a better job at what they're doing, uh, perhaps even access to some of these phantasmagorical assistive devices that we were alluding mm -hmm. to. Um, so there, I think that there are lots of incentives that we can begin to build into existing systems. What is the most important change that should be made and, and that's within grasp, <laughs> that's realistic and that can be done now? Any major change that we've ever had in this country came from the ground up. Okay. And the way to get that out there is to just in your libraries, in your churches, in your public access TV, in your newspapers, just bring this out of the closet so that caregivers understand that first of all they have some power here, that they have some power. We need to build local coalitions that can manage their own system. We need to develop ways that caregivers know to demand a care plan. We need to figure out the financing better. I mean basically everybody here is at risk of spending down. You know, almost nobody has enough assets to tolerate, say, 10 years of uh, living after a terrible stroke or, or with dementia. So all of us are Medicaid uh, beneficiaries in training. Surely there must be at least one senator and one congressperson who has dealt with caregiving in his or her own life. Um, and I think that perhaps we should try to find some of those people so that in addition to our telling our stories and encouraging other caregivers to tell their stories, that the representatives and senators share with their peers some of their own stories. But I would recommend that we be bold and we be brave. And people say, can we really handle this? And they get worried about it, and rightfully so. We should be concerned. But remember when America wanted to go to the moon? If we have an America that can go to the moon, we have an America that can solve these issues and provide the dignity and quality of care that our seniors deserve. Many questions remain on the complicated issues surrounding caregiving and elder care. Let's listen in as our experts fill questions ranging from the interpretation of dying to the role of government in caring for the aging. A lot of the stories come back to what seems to be a basic problem of the oath of do no harm. And the fact that a lot of doctors seem to view death as a failure as opposed to something that's going to happen to everybody. So I'm wondering if you see anything changing in the educational process with doctors that will start to make this acceptable too, because I think that's a, a big problem. I think, I think it's death as failure, but it's also fear of suits. 
-hmm. no fear that if you don't do everything that it's going to come back to bite you and I think there has to be a training program that death is part of life you know we used to think that we used to know that death is not the enemy uh, that death will come to all of us. The mortality rate still, the last time I checked, was 100%. Uh, but to also, at the same time, begin to educate physicians to understand that some of our tried and true interventions are not quite as harmless as we previously thought. Our culture, too, is very uncomfortable with the idea of end of life. So a lot of families don't discuss it. Mm -hmm. And parents don't want to discuss it with their children. The children don't want to get into it. So in all fairness to the medical profession and um, physicians, the families in some cases don't help either. Can you please discuss some recommendations that you might have about promoting professional health care provider volunteer service. I think we ought to use our regularly set up community organizations. Many churches have health committees that are run by nurses and they could recruit their friends and, and get a training program together. There's a wonderful talent pool and as boomers and others start to retire or perhaps move to consulting and not working 60 hour weeks will have uh, much more talent available. And there have been many studies done over the years about the value to the volunteers themselves. Every volunteer I've ever spoken to says they get more out of it than the people they're volunteering for and with. Healthcare providers, such as myself and I think you, are often most concerned that everyone who truly needs care gets it and we're willing to give away a little to make that happen. Do you have any ideas on how we could address this fundamental conflict because I think until we address it it's going to be really hard to move forward. The conflict being uh, the, the sense on the part of many people that we're squandering money yeah. on people who don't deserve it and yet people who are applying have to go through all of these hoops which right. are demeaning really. Right. Absolutely. Okay where do we find the balance? Um, well, I think first of all recognizing that aging issues aren't simply aging issues they're family issues, community issues, and society issues. And so our very soul as a society needs to think about the fact that how we treat our most vulnerable citizens is what we'll be judged by. But we do have to make it possible for the ordinary person, you know, the school teacher, the bus driver, mm -hmm. to look forward to an old age in which they can be confident that they will have those basic elements and can start searching for meaning. What are your thoughts on improving not just the quantity to meet the tsunami, but the quality of long-term services that people are going to need in the coming years. Is that better served as embracing these services better into the existing health care and medical system? Or is it better served through a more social model outside of the medical system? I'd like mm -hmm. to hear your thoughts. Okay. I will weigh in right away on <laughs> it's got to be much more social. Yes. I mean, you go to any other country and see how they're putting together services for the elderly and it is so much more managed by social workers, chaplain sorts, uh, civic leaders, uh, you know, the county council mm -hmm. and the thought that somehow uh, going through medical school taught me how to provide housing for people who you know, need, need housing is just Again, doesn't make any sense. Why do we run the Medicaid housing through doctors? As a medical director, I thought I could fix it. I was going to do an education program so that my caregivers would understand what they were doing. And in 90 days, I had to start over because I, the turnover was that fast. So you have to give people a living wage. And then you'll attract people who want to do this as a career. And you can get the time with them to educate them about what they need to do. So often in long-term care, people not only give up their car keys, their mailbox, but they give up their purpose for life. Mm -hmm. And so we need to have all that involved and really support models that are out there that are working. But I'm often amazed mm -hmm. at how many people have never heard of them. What ideas do you have that to, to get the professionals to listen to the on-site care teams? It's mm -hmm. about money, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. <laughs> When I try to teach physicians about giving family conferences, there is a code that you can use to get paid for that. And you can have those home teams come in, you can do it conference call speakerphone, but you have to teach people how to get paid for it. 
and then you have to actually pay people for it because there are also some codes you can use that you won't get reimbursed for. You won't be surprised, Cheryl, that I'll ratchet it up a notch. I know. <laughs> How about we give the family member the authority to authorize the payment? And you don't get paid unless the family member, the care or the patient, if the patient's still capable, but the family member, when not, um, is satisfied. It has to be about a mandate and not just about money, though money helps. Uh, I think that you need to have the clinician group, maybe it's this accountable care organization, maybe it's the hospital, whoever it is, have as a part of the basic care that just like you learn that you find out who the health care proxy is, you get the Medicare card, you all the things that you know you have to do, you also have to involve the caregiver in both ongoing care and the advanced care planning, and that nothing else is acceptable. What can employers and service providers do to make that role be something that's more productive and helpful and also represent the um, patient better? Hmm. The remote caregiver, you mean the person who's at uh, some distance. Uh, um, yeah, that's obviously more and more common. There's some wonderful, you know, the technological gizmos uh, yeah. that, that now make it much more plausible. You can equip a reasonable size apartment with uh, granny cams now mm -hmm. that allow a, a caregiver at a distance to really stay involved. Um, you can have that person involved through a Skype kind of connection uh, with, the, with the team so you can actually see them. Uh, you can do advanced directives on YouTubes. I mean, why not? You know, why think that they're, you know, checklists on some state form? You know, have the person really talk to it. Um, yeah, the, the hands-on care at the point where the person really needs someone to help them get out of bed is going to need somebody who's not remote. I think people ought to know about professional geriatric care managers. Yes. Oh, that yeah. That you can put a z your zip code into that caremanager.org site and find somebody who's licensed in the area where your loved one is. And I have taken care of people in Arizona and Philadelphia and Detroit and everything doing that. And it's a way to, a way to really have somebody's eyes on things for you. My question is, if Medicare can pay for nursing home care, why can't they pay for home care? Medicare doesn't usually pay for nursing home care. It's Medicaid, but that's the problem. I mean, we know that it would be less expensive. And that's the thing, one of the things we're trying to change is to point out to legislators that it is less expensive to do it in a different way. As a single person, divorced, no children, I purchased a long-term policy, uh, long-term care. I want to find out, um, are there any pitfalls to that? Is there some questions I should be asking? Because I still want a decent quality of life, and after taking care of my dad, there's no one really there to take care of me. I think for you, one of the biggest things, not just insurance, is who will make those decisions? Who will coordinate that care for you and giving somebody power of attorney to do that is going to be critical. I think many long-term care insurance plans um, have eligibility requirements. You are not eligible for that $70,000 a year until you have become impaired to some point. And to know just how impaired you've got to be in order to be eligible. Uh, so that's one issue. And then once you are deemed eligible, what is the waiting period before you get the first dollar of those benefits? Um, I've seen uh, many, many patients and families who say, oh, I have long-term care insurance, no problem. Uh, they are indeed eligible and they won't get any payments for three months. Three months is too late. By then they're gone. This is impacting every family. And what our office in Lansing, the Office of Services to the Aging used to say, is that 30 years ago they couldn't get anybody to pay attention to these issues. Now they can because legislators are calling not just for their constituents but about their own families. And so as this impacts everybody personally, I'll, I think we'll see more and more engagement by community leaders. The greatest gift that you can give your children, or if you have them, is the absolute knowledge of what you want. Not only speaking with them, but written out. What I'm hoping is that the country will rally and figure out how to take care of one another through this piece of life in a way that allows people to be comfortable and live meaningfully without bankrupting the community.
The aging baby boom generation continues to have an enormous influence on our society. Even Hollywood is beginning to take notice. Recent films have showcased an older woman trying to find a comfortable place to spend her final days with an eclectic group of friends. Another movie chronicles, dare we say, a love story with an older couple. Boomers have never been a quiet group, and they are not likely to go gently when it comes to getting and giving end-of-life care. It's their time again to help lead the changes that are necessary to deal with the silver tsunami. On behalf of Eleanor Cliff and our panel of caregiving experts, we thank you for watching our broadcast. I'm Desiree Cooper. You can get information on caregiving and end-of-life issues on the following websites. Caregivers Confronting the Care System was underwritten by Altarum Institute. Altarum, solving complex problems to improve human health.